Howdy y'all, welcome back to Little Bits. Today I want to talk a little bit about a technology that I use every day. Pens, pens, stationery, paper, inks, writing, writing instruments, journaling, all that good stuff. Now, here you can see a small sample of a my pen collection that's representative of the collection as a whole. Uh, I have many more pens than this and I will add many more to it. This kind of covers kind of all the companies, brands I use, the types of nibs I like to write with. Um, I also have some inks here. Most of these are archival quality inks. I want to test these permanent inks um, against, this one's not a permanent ink, against each other and kind of see how they perform with a water dip test, which will will spread some water across some writing samples and, and see what that looks like. Now you can see I have uh, some nice travel journals here. These are Franklin Kristoff. I have a lot of Franklin Kristoff pens. I have some vintage pens here. These, these two are vintage. Uh, I have some ball pens here to just give some examples of ball pens. I don't use ball pens myself anymore. Yeah, I really like this journaling bundle. I use these for different things. One of which is to write down the script for this video. So let me find that sucker. So I wanna talk a little bit about the different pen technologies that you see here. And I want to talk about why I standardize on and why I recommend others to standardize on fountain pens. Specifically, you see most of these are fountain pens. I'll also show you some writing samples as I alluded to. I wanna do some ink tests here. I just got some of these inks in recently and I want to uh, see how they perform. I'm really particularly interested in archive quality inks, though I do use non-permanent inks and non-waterproof inks for fun and art sometimes. Uh, those can always be sealed with, you know, some kind of art sealant, like, I don't know if it's called Mod Podge or whatever it is. Now, some of you may already be well versed on this topic, and I'll be covering a lot of the basics here, so I'm not an expert on this, so feel free to correct me or add context for those interested, I'm just kind of going to do a high level overview, uh, not really get too into depth, but I do want to dive a little more deeply into uh, fountain pen technology specifically, how they work uh, and why, why they're a good choice. First of all, let's talk about ball pens. So there are three types of ball pens. Most people just know them as ballpoint pens. I'm pretty sure this is a ballpoint pen. Uh, you know, it's got the the ballpoint, uh, but there's also gel pens, which also use a ballpoint. They're not called ballpoint pens, they're called gel pens. And then there's roller ball pens, which also use a ballpoint. Now the difference between these is the type of ink that they use. Uh, gel pens obviously use a gel-based ink, as is indicated, and they actually rely on the action of the ball rolling it against the surface of the ink and a force called the shearing force. The ink itself is applied through the action of the shearing force of the ball moving, which is a little different supposedly than the physics of how these two work. I don't remember what ink ballpoint pens use. Ballpoint pens are the most versatile though. They can write on almost any surface, whether it's oily, whether it's bad paper, whether it's cardboard. They, they can, if you can think to try to write on it, ballpoints can write on it. And that's one reason that ballpoints have sort of dominated the market for so long since their invention and replaced uh, ball pens. Roller ball pens are a lot like fountain pens in that they use a water-based ink and they need to stay capped if you don't want that ink to dry out. This pen can dry out if we don't leave this cap on it. Now this is a high-end one. Um, it was on sale because nobody wants a roller ball pen so it went for way less than <laughs> it should have but uh, you know uh, I don't use it, it's, it's whatever. Um, ballpoint pen sucks, gel pen sucks. These pens suck, all right? This one's good if you like ball pens. Uh, roller ball pens are kind of the most ergonomic, easiest, smoothest writing. Now, one of the big things about these ball pens is that because of their application mechanism, all of them require pressure to write. You have to use pressure to write and Roller balls are going to be the ones that require the least amount of pressure, making them the most ergonomic writing instruments of the three ball pen types. Compared to that, fountain pens write under their own weight. It's kind of the famous 
famously known thing about them. You don't need to apply pressure to write with them. And because of that, you can write with them for very long periods without your hand cramping, without writing discomfort. If you don't have writing discomfort with ballpoint pens, you do. You just don't write for long enough uh, to have the discomfort. I guarantee you, if you write for long enough, you're gonna have some discomfort. Uh, you can write for hours with a, a fountain pen without any issues. Now, I use the bullet journaling method. I'm not gonna show you the inside of this. It's got private stuff in it, but I do use the bullet journaling method and I pair a pen with it. This pen here has a, has a fine, what they call a needle point nib, and it's very fine point. It allows me to pack a lot of information to a very small space with small text if I need to. So it's really great for bullet journaling. Um, but I keep these together. It's one of the ways that I do my journaling. Uh, I, I review this every morning and I review it every night and I go through my tasks. The full bullet journal system, I, I use the whole thing. Uh, this is kind of my, my mini uh, workday bullet journal. I use this uh, to, um, to keep track of stuff I need to do during the workday or throughout the work week. Uh, right now it's just full of job hunting stuff because I did get laid off in December, which sucks, but also uh, screw that place, so whatever. The focus of this is gonna be the fountain pens and the inks. Um, so let's talk about the commonalities of fountain pens. First of all, I'm gonna set this one aside because this is a brush pen and not a fountain pen. Um, it does have some similarities to a fountain pen but uh, that's, that's different. So all fountain pens have uh, some common um, traits that are, that are gonna be, first of all, the anatomy. This is called the barrel, the cap, obviously. This is called the section. It comes apart, it's where it unscrews. Uh, the metal part itself is the nib. This plastic part underneath is called the feed. Um, and then besides that, they can have different internal filling mechanisms. This one is configured as an eyedropper right now, which means that I've used uh, some silicone gel to seal off the threads in the section, and I've just filled it using an eyedropper with the ink. In this case, this pen has uh, an iron gall ink named Gummy Berry in it. This is actually, it's a very beautiful ink, but it, it is far from archive quality, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop using it once I once I work through this, at least for certain types of projects. Um, it's a little aside. Uh, a lot of these are also able to be filled with either a cartridge or a converter. I believe this one has a cartridge in it right now. I was open and pointed up in case I do have them configured as an eyedropper and forget because I have spilled ink all over myself. Um, so this is a cartridge, this is a disposable plastic case that has, um, this one has a little metal ball in it and uh, to help mix the ink and help get it flowing. And it also has um, dark blue deatramentous dark blue document ink, which is a permanent archival quality ink. Uh, my standard ink for a long time has been the De Atramentis document line. Uh, you can see here I also have, I just got in the De Atramentis archive ink, which is a different chemistry. It's supposed to be even better, uh, but um, I think I'm gonna switch to iron gall inks because I'm really starting to standardize on gold nibs I'm really starting to standardize on flex nibs. Let's talk about the filling technologies. Is my cat growling? Sylvester, leave her alone. Sylvester, leave her alone. Lollipop. So let's talk about some of the differences between these pens. Now, like I said, I have some of these configured as eyedroppers. This is one. Some of them are designed to be eyedroppers. These two are from a company called Opus 88, and they are designed to be eyedroppers. They actually have a mechanism inside them that allows you to seal them up such that they do not uh, flow. That's particularly good if you're taking them on an airplane. Um, they're, this, it's also good for priming the nib. When you first fill it up sometimes, um, these nibs, you know, they won't flow right away. So you can, you, can kinda, you can pull this out and turn it upside down and kind of prime the nib with it. You'll usually end up with some drops of ink on the paper, but 
uh, you can get the ink the ink flowing very quickly. Now on the Opus 88s, I actually have quite a few of these and I put different colors in them. I, I use standardized colors uh, of De Atramentis Document Ink uh, and I use these as kind of art and calligraphy pens. You can see that I have very broad nibs installed on these. This is a 2.3 millimeter broad stub nib. And this is a 1.9 millimeter broad music stub nib, which is uh, from Franklin Christoph. This has the stock Opus 88 nib on it. I bought it for that big nib and the big ink capacity. Eyedropper pens are gonna be your biggest ink capacity. This is also configured as an eyedropper right now. Um, I can't remember the maker of this. It's it's an individual, independent pen maker. Um, I'll try to look them up and give them a shout out. The cartridge converter pens, they can also use something called a converter. Now a converter converts a cartridge pen to a piston pen. Uh, let me think, which one has a piston in it right now? Uh, one of these has a piston in them. Which one is it? This one has a piston in it. All right, so the brush pen here is an example of a converter pen. Now, a lot of, I have converters that fit a lot of these pens as well, um, but this little mechanism, it has a, a knob that you twist and it's got a little piston in there and you can use that to uh, draw ink up. You can see some of the ink that's still in there is being drawn backwards. Uh, you can draw ink up into it from an ink well. So uh, if you don't want to use a converter or a cartridge, uh, then you can switch to this and you can use bottled inks. Um, you can also use bottled inks on a standard uh, cartridge if you clean out the cartridge and use a syringe to fill them up. I do that as well. Uh, so when you get good quality cartridges, they're worth saving because you can, you can reuse them. They're not really as disposable as they say. Now, these are some vintage pens. Now, these vintage pens are very different in terms of their filling mechanism. They have something called a uh, lever fill mechanism, as you can see, and these levers are attached to a metal component on the inside that kind of sp spans the barrel here. And um, when you pull this lever out, what it does is it presses the box against the inside of the barrel and inside the barrel there is a uh, rubber sack installed and I'll show you that actually. The thing with vintage pens is you often need special tooling to get them apart. In this case I have I think this is called nylon rubber or something like that. Um, I can't remember the material exactly. It's a type of rubber um, and you can use it as a, as a pen grip so I can actually get this pen apart if I carefully grip the section, you don't want to grip the nib, and I can twist and pull. And here you see the sack. And actually this sack is collapsed. This sack needs replacing. This particular pen um, I got as new old stock. And uh, I didn't, they didn't know it was new old stock, but when I examined it, it was, it was very clearly new old stock. So this pen was 99 years old when I got it. It's over 100 now. And um, this is probably the original sack that was installed on it. And even though it had never been used, uh, this sack is old. So you can see it's already, what this is supposed to do is when you squeeze it and then release it, it fills back out and creates a little vacuum and draws the ink up into it. That actually explains a lot. This pen has not been holding as much ink as I believe it should be able to lately. So that, that needs a new sack installed. And, Actually, I can save that for a video maybe, but this one has a fairly new sack installed as I understand it, and it's actually, I'd never seen one before like this. You can see someone tried to get in here with a wrench or something, and uh, left some damage here. So I got this pen very cheaply actually, even though it's, it's worth more than what I paid for it, even it, with, in this condition. So now I'm gonna take this one apart. Now, sometimes these are threaded, so you, you do want to normally twist, but I know that these ones aren't threaded. So you can see this sack here, it's clear. I've never seen one of these before. And this one's new, you can see it's not collapsed. Um, when you squeeze it, it returns to form. It creates that vacuum that draws it up. This is an older pen technology. 
Modern pens are not gonna be using these. Uh, we buy vintage pens a lot in the pen community because um, they just don't make them like they used to. And sometimes, you know, you can find really special pens. Particularly, I buy vintage pens particularly to um, participate in flex pen writing. Uh, both of these vintage pens have flex nibs on them. These are 14 to 18 to 24 or to 21 carat sometimes. Uh, I think both of mine are either 14K or 18K. I think they're both 14K. But the nib itself is 14 carats and um, of gold. And uh, they also are somewhat flexible. You may not be able to see that. This is a semi-flex. These are actually both semi-flexes. This one's more flexible than this one, but uh, neither of them are what constitutes a full flex nib. Um, I've also worked with modern full flex nibs. I, I just, just recently catastrophically dropped a Pen Realms Flex Commander nib, which is devastating because they're very expensive and I destroyed it. Uh, but what I'm learning is that uh, vintage gold nibs are actually pretty, flex nibs are actually pretty robust. They can kind of handle a lot. So those are kind of the different filling mechanisms, the different technologies. Uh, the nibs themselves, uh, unlike ball pens, they rely on the capillary action of ink flowing through this little narrow slit between the two tines. Uh, some, some nibs have more tines. You can see uh, this music nib has, has three tines and two slits. And that allows it to write very wet on a very broad surface. Um, this one's even broader, but it only has two tines and a single slit. But it, it also is, is more difficult to get started writing. Um, all right, so those, those are my pens. Um, we'll talk about the companies a little bit. These are both Watermans, these vintage ones. Uh, I tend to go Waterman so far. I have some other um, brands I want to look into for flex nibs. I really love flex writing. Flex nibs are my favorite types of pens to use. So I'm going to be investing in a lot more, uh, both modern flex nibs as well as, uh, vintage flex pens like these, especially larger ones that hold more ink and especially eyedropper ones, because that's my favorite filling mechanism. Um, we'll write with those a little bit, show you what that looks like. Um, these, these five pens are all Franklin Kristoff. Some of them have some of their uh, unique grinds on them. They have something called a SIG nib, which stands for stub um, italic gradient, which is a very smooth writing nib that provides some uh, line variation and is quite fun to use. I have some broads and some mediums of those. I want to get some fines of those soon. I never used to like writing with fine nibs until I started improving my handwriting. Now, You'll see when I start doing writing samples that I do not have the best handwriting. Um, people tell me I have good handwriting, but it, it's I've been working on it a lot in the past couple years. I've been using uh, fountain pens for maybe three years now, two and a half, something like that. And um, I've, I've only really started exploring cursive again. I did learn cursive in elementary school, but we stopped using it immediately. And let me tell you, the next time I hear somebody complain about how nobody learns cursive anymore, that's on the generation that abandoned fountain pens because fountain pens are made for cursive. Cursive is made for fountain pens, rather. Cur modern cursive script as we know it is a fountain pen script. And so when we started using nothing but ballpoint pens and cheap Bix in this country, uh, the US here, uh, that's when cursive died. It, it's, it didn't die because we stopped teaching it. It died because the generation before the generation that stopped teaching it stopped using fountain pens. It's very non-ergonomic to use a ball pen for cursive. If you're gonna do it, use rollerball because that's gonna be your least frustrating experience. If you All right, write. so I'm gonna show you some writing samples from some of these pens. Um, show you some of the nibs I use and, and what I use them for. I mean, I really just use them for whatever. I, um, any pen that I, any writing that I want to last a long time goes into some kind of journal um, with archival quality paper and archival quality ink like this uh, Rhodia, I think, web notebook. Oh no, this is Leuchtturm. 
Um, this is a really good one. I also use Rhodia a lot. These are some Kokuyo papers. These are called campus papers. This is their, I think they're Sarasa. They have another one. There's two of them. One of them's a little more feedbacky than the other one. This is the more feedbacky one. I'm not sure what paper this is, but it came out of a, this blank one underneath, it came out of a fountain pen friendly journal thing, A4 paper pad that had a bunch of different types in it. Um, I think this is one I selected because the there's a little sheet of information about each different type of paper in it and it was missing for this one, which is why I don't know what it is. And I've, I've pulled those out and put them somewhere else for uh, reference for when I go search for journals with these papers in them. So that's one thing about fountain pens, you have to, you have to be choosy about your paper and paper's not cheap. So um, good paper's not cheap because you can end up with bad paper and your, your pens won't write on them, they'll feather, they'll bleed, uh, it, your writing won't be legible. If, if you have paper that's bad, you know, ballpoint pen, whatever, but if you invest in good paper, then uh, you'll have a good time. So this is a, an Edison, this is called the Unicorn Pen. It's, it's full name is Unicorn Vomit because it looks like Unicorn Vomit, supposedly. I actually have a Franklin Christoph uh, 14 karat gold um, cursive calligraphy nib on here. And I use this one for uh, my grimoire. Now I, I'm a wizard and I do magic and I'm not joking. So uh, this is what I use for it. Right now it has this KWZ gummy berry ink in it, which again is beautiful, but um, is not as archival quality as I would have liked. This is an iron gall ink. Now you see some block letters here. That's my name. Don't wear it out. This nib is actually quite challenging to use. It's a pretty challenging nib. It takes some patience. It has a very uh, difficult sweet spot to get. Uh, you can see getting good lettering out of it takes practice. Um, even if you can write well, which I did not do here. This is not writing well in my opinion. Uh, but that's gummy berry. That's on a cursive calligraphy. Now cursive calligraphy nibs are like calligraphy nibs or are like italic nibs um, in that they are, they're kind of closer to a stub nib. Now there's, there's all sorts of different nib cuts that you can get. Um, this is a sharp italic. And a sharp italic is like, the end of the nib is sharp. It's like this. It's cut sharp and you can feel it. It gives you a lot of feedback. I'm just, this is nothing, I'm just making marks. But it's very useful for italics, you know, um, if you have a very specific style of lettering you wanna do, which I'm not very good at yet. I practice every day and I, I have improved a lot, but my handwriting was never good to begin with, so it's taking a lot of work to improve it. Uh, when I first started doing this a few years ago, my cursive was not even legible. I could not tell the difference between any, any of the major letters in my cursive. And now I, I can at least read and write, read what I wrote. Here's an example of one of the sig nibs. This is actually one of their Franklin Christoph's medium sig nibs. This is a steel nib. It's a unique cut to them. There are other nib meisters out there who make similar cuts, uh, but this is this one is or cuts that claim to, to have similar properties rather. But this is a unique cut, and it also has a very similar line variation. Now it's a it's a lot less pronounced, but there is line variation, and it's very comfortable to write with. Now this is a non-permanent ink. Uh, this is also a Franklin Christoph ink. Um, they make inks that are non-permanent, but very beautiful. As far as I understand, none of these are waterproof. None of them are permanent. None of them are archive quality, but I do still have a collection of some of their inks. Um, let me show you another nib here. Oh, this is also a sig nib. This is a broad sig nib. Now I always use permanent Deatramentous pink fuchsia. Is it like 
that. Fuchsia is a weird word. It's spelled weird. It's like this. Like, where's that? What? What? Anyway, yeah. So I have a set of pens that I have several sets of pens that always have standard permanent colors in them. If I want specific color for a specific document or a specific project and it needs to be permanent, archival quality ink. I use the De Atramentis document inks. They come in all sorts of colors. Their pink is one of the best permanent pinks on the market. I've never seen another permanent waterproof ink that performs like this. Uh, there's one out there that's even a, like a brighter hot pink from um, Noodler's ink that I tried, but it, it writes dry and it does not pass my photocopier tests, which means that when I try to run it through a photocopy, I don't get legible text out of it. I just get kind of a blank page. For Deandromentous Document Inks, every single one of their colors passes my photocopy tests. Um, now, I'm for my gold nibs, I pretty much have switched to iron gall inks. Iron gall inks are supposed to be permanent and waterproof, but they're not all made equal, and you'll see that. This here is an iron gall ink, this gummy berry, but it's it, it's not gonna, you'll see it when I do the water test. It's not really gonna hold up. Uh, the, the, the key with iron gall inks is that the the iron gall component of it darkens over time. That is the permanent part of the ink. It's what seeps into the paper's fibers. It, what's, it's what stays behind if the ink is, is damaged in any way, such as if water is put on it. Um, so the permanent aspects of uh, a iron gall ink have to do with the iron gall component, which comes from, and an iron gall is, is uh, actually a tree disease. If you, if you don't know about iron gall inks, um, these inks are very traditionally made from plant parts. And one of those parts is iron gall. And, and it's, it's a disease that grows on trees that happens to give properties that make inks permanent. This is Rohrer and Klinger Scabiosa. We got uh, Diamine, Diamine Archive or Archival Registrar's ink. This is a blue black. Uh, this is not a um, iron gall ink. This is this is Deatramentus Archive ink. Nobody really knows their recipes. They, they they have like secret recipes. This is not necessarily an iron gall ink. Now this is talked about in its marketing as being as having iron components in it, but nowhere does it say you know iron gall anywhere in the marketing material for this this is one of the best archival inks that i have though right now they make a whole line of various blacks uh in my in what i've seen this is one of the better performers when it comes to permanence and water resistance is this forest black i love green green is one of my very favorite colors in the world um this ink is very deep rich it has a lot of depth to it or a lot of um kind of personality to it and uh, we'll actually see that in action now. So let me show you some of these flex nibs real quick. Now I'm using this Forest Black in this Waterman. This is a celluloid body pen compared to this, which is a um, ebonite body pen. Uh, ebonite being a hardened rubber material that is still used to this day to make um, pipe stems for smoking pipes, briar pipes, tobacco pipes. Now this is my favorite writing experience here is working with these vintage flex nibs. And you can see you get more line variation based on how much pressure you put on the nib. That's about, that's almost a full flex. When I first got this, it was much stiffer, but it was new old stock, so it seems to have loosened up. Uh, this one is uh, semi-flex for sure. You can see it doesn't, it takes more work to flex it. It won't flex as far. If I try to flex it as far too often, I'll do something called springing the tines and it won't write anymore. Now I really like these because these are great for cursive and I never really wrote in cursive before, but I've been practicing for nearly three years now and with these flex nibs, I finally find, find myself 
automatically writing in cursive and really enjoying it and um, writing faster than I used to be able to write in just print. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really focusing now on improving the look of my handwriting, uh, which I, in a few years I expect to be, you know, quite nice. Um, right now I'm still in a getting to know, getting to know how to, how to move my, my hand on the paper stages, but um, my consistency is improving, uh, my letter consistency, my sizing and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and then let's look at this, uh, this brush pen real quick. Now, this brush pen is fun, but it's easily one of the hardest. Uh, you can get some very fine brush strokes with it, but you have to have a really light touch to maintain a fine brush stroke. And it's just like using any other brush. This is wolf hair, supposedly. Wolf hair is very common um, for writing in, I think, Japanese tradition specifically, but perhaps also other ideogrammic languages that rely on brush pens. Um, now, I'm really not that good at this. You can do bubble lettering in English, uh, but I'm not that good at it. And this is probably not a representative example of it, but um, this is Deatrementis Red document ink, so that's permanent as well. And the cool thing about document ink, a lot of people like the Deatrementis document ink specifically for watercolors, because you can do outlines of your art, you can you know, draw your characters or whatever, and then you can run watercolors over them and they will not stain, it won't cause the ink to move. This ink won't budge usually when you're doing watercolors with them. So, um, but uh, Dea Tremendous also recently released a line of artist inks that are supposed to be even better for that. So uh, check those out too if you, if you are interested. Now we're gonna use this blank paper a bit to do some tests. I almost threw this off the table. Woo! Uh, and we're gonna use some of these glass pens. We're gonna use one of these glass pens to actually dip test these because um, you know uh, some of these are filled, some of them aren't. You know, these aren't the, some of these inks aren't in any of my pens right now. So uh, first we'll start with the forest black. That's, that's kind of what I'm used to here using. This is, this is my standard, right? Like when in doubt, this is the ink that I fill a pen with at this point, as, as long as it's a gold nib. Uh, I do sometimes fill the iron gall inks into um, steel nib pens, but I don't do it often. So this is... Platinum, ooh, that's bad. I should have practiced with this pen before I used it for this video. Forest Black, let's see if I can improve. Uh, it's Platinum Forest Black, and it's called Forest Black. All this whole line of classic inks from Platinum, uh, they're called something or other black because with oxidation over time, this ink will turn black um, eventually. It'll, it'll darken over time. When you go back and revisit, even a week later, you can see it, it actually comes out quite a bit darker sometimes. So we're gonna rinse that sucker off. We don't really wanna cross-contaminate these inks. Um, there are preservatives and stuff in them, but you also want to be careful because uh, you can um, you can contaminate them with the organisms. You can end up with stuff growing in there, and you don't want that. Now, this is my first time ever using this Diamine Blue Black Registrar's ink. This is supposed to be a very, very permanent archive quality ink. Ooh, that's beautiful. Not the D, the color. That's that's a very bad D. Diamine registrars. I apologize for the low quality of my handwriting right now. I really need to uh, practice at this table more. I usually write in my lap and I am not doing as well as I expected to. <laughs> I swear to you, I can write better than this. It's just, I haven't practiced at this table very much. But 
uh, take my word for it. So that's, I really like that. I'm gonna get more of that for sure. This will, this will be a standard as well, um, especially for documents that require blue ink. Um, all right, I got a little bit of that on my fingers, didn't I? You always get ink on your fingers when you work with these things. Let's try the archive ink now. Um, I know that the document inks are pigment based, so you often have to mix them beforehand. I don't know if this archive ink is also pigment, pigment based. Um, so I don't know if, if it's necessary to mix it like I just did, but oh, we'll find out now. I've already used this one in samples before. I've, I've filled pens with it and I really like it. It writes a little bit drier than the document ink black, but it's, it's a similar experience. Um, it's supposed to be uh, very long lasting though. So let's see if we can do a better D here. There we go. Still a bit wobbly. Archive ink. It's a very dark black. It's hard to mistake it for anything else. Uh, which I say because sometimes these dark blues, you're like, am I using a black ink right now? Um, of course, this one should turn black over time. Let's take a look at this uh, KWZ gummy berry. I got water on these bottles somehow. I think my cat's knocked over some water. Um, this one I'm very familiar with, but I want to show you the water re test results for all of these. Um, this is a very beautiful ink, very beautiful ink. I love that ink, it's, it's hard not to play with, but it's not particularly uh, archive quality as far as I'm concerned. Um, so there's that, there's that. Now we're gonna try, I've never tried a Roarer and Klinger bottle before, but I've always heard good things. This is my candidate to replace this. This is supposed to be kind of a purple violet uh, but a lot more archive quality, a lot more water resistant specifically. So let's test that out. Gabiosa. I think that's a good replacement candidate. It's a little darker. It seems to write more wet. That's more watery. Of course, that's I did just dip it in water, so maybe that has something to do with that. But uh, I really like that. That's a that's a strong candidate for a replacement for gummy berry, assuming it stands up to the water dip tests. All right, and now last we're gonna do, um, this is a color called Honeycomb by Franklin Kristoff. This is a non-permanent ink, non-waterproof ink. And I just kinda wanna throw it on there and see how it stands up to the others. Oops, that's not it. Franklin, Franklin, my dear, I give many dams. You can see my 
my, uh, oh, that's actually bleeding a lot. I wonder if that's because. That's interesting. I don't think it's because of water. I think, uh, I think this ink and this paper don't get along. So sometimes you'll see that. All these other inks are doing quite well on this paper, but this little guy is having some feathering issues. You see that feathering really bad over here. So that's interesting. And I use this, I use this ink a lot, so it's actually very interesting because it's not prone to feathering on other papers that I've used it on. It's doing it, and that's just ink, that's not water. So that's an interesting result there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important to find good paper when you're using fountain pens, because if you don't, it'll look like crap. Oh, I'm sorry, kitty. I'm oh, sorry, kitty. I keep disturbing my cats. All right, so let's wait for this to dry. These are mostly dry. Um, there's still some water drops from here. But most of these inks are dry. Some of them have quicker drying times than others. Uh, but we're gonna go ahead and run some water on them. Whoop, whoop, whoop. See how they perform. That's pretty good, actually. Even the KWZ is performing better than I expected. Um, quite a bit better. Although you can see the Scaviosa definitely is more resistant to the water. And even this non-permanent one is doing okay. Although you can see it caused even further feathering. The archive ink is like, boom, it's just standing up to it. You can see it spreading a little bit of black, but I think a lot of that is coming from these other colors, honestly. I'm impressed by all of those. I'm very impressed. Even this one did okay. So, you know, that's a surprising result to me. Uh, yeah, well, that's it. That's all I wanted to do. I kind of just babbled about pens and inks and stuff, and that's how I live my life is babbling about technology. So... I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to ask for recommendations. I, I, I've gone through a lot of pens and nibs and stuff and I can kind of give some strong feedback on uh, what might work for certain types of writers and certain types of artists and what might not work. I like them all. Just about any pen nib combination I can get, I tend to enjoy, so. Um, but not everybody does, not everybody does. For example, this is an architect nib, which I meant to show off but did not. It writes wider lines sideways than vertically. It's often used in like manga drawing and it's used for Hebrew often. The tetragrammaton, tetragrammaton, tetragrammaton. Depending on your writing needs, depending on what language you're writing on, what types of alphabets or ideogrammic languages you're working with, um, different pens have different strengths, different nibs have different strengths. When you find the ones you want, when you find the ones that work well for you, stick with them. You'll only need a few pens to last a lifetime. You'll be happy writing for the rest of your life. There you go. Buy fountain pens, you'll thank yourself. Peace.